Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin. I am a One Mind Dogs coach from South Carolina and I have been training dogs for almost my entire life. I grew up in the agility world as a junior handler and I have been a part of the One Mind Dogs community for many, many years now. One of the main topics that comes up in every single training session is motivation. Whether the dogs are too motivated or not motivated at all, it, it all comes together in how successful you can be in your training session. So today we're going to be talking about how you can tap into your dog's full potential and build drive for agility. So this is going to be for those dogs that we want to get more out of. Maybe they're not running their course so fast. Maybe they're getting distracted as you're trying to work or other things like that. So that's going to be our focus for today is focusing on the dogs that maybe aren't as excited or as happy doing agility as they could be. So when we are talking about this, we're going to be talking about the five main culprits that could be causing your dogs to not be going as fast or as excited as they could be in agility. So the topics we're going to be talking about today are going to be including choosing your motivator, how to reward with that motivator, how do you structure your training session, which includes choosing when you're going to train, and when you are training, how many repetitions should you do? Now, all of these things will adjust according to your specific dog. So when you are listening through, I want you to be focusing on having your dog in your head, or maybe you're working with a student's dog. Have that dog in your head as you're working through this. Every single dog is going to have their own little bubble here. So try to only think of that specific dog as you're working through. But I think this is such a fun topic and it's such a relevant topic that will always be popping up in your courses. So what I want to do first is talk about choosing your motivator. Now, when we are talking about choosing our motivator, this is the ground level of our training. This is where it all starts. If we don't have a motivator, we can't do anything. We're not going to do any training sessions. We're not going to add any type of excitement or anything. We need a motivator just like we need motivators as we go through life. Just like in the human world, dogs will have different types of things that motivate them. So what might motivate one person in life, let's say, ooh, I get a flower when I do this work, but maybe someone is allergic to flowers. So getting a flower isn't such a great thing. You want something that is going to be worthwhile to your specific dog. Just because one thing works for one dog doesn't mean it's going to work for your dog. So think about your specific dog when we're talking about choosing the motivator. When we're thinking about motivators, it's important that you're also paying attention to your dog in everyday life. What types of objects do they tend to want to interact with as you're going through? Some things that they interact with, we don't necessarily like them to interact with, but I want to take note of that. When I first get a dog, my first thing that I'm doing is trying to introduce them to as many different objects and things as possible and taking note of their different reactions. Sometimes they'll light up and get really excited and then I have a note that, okay, maybe I'm going to pull this out at a later date for motivation. But other times I'll see that they kind of shut down, their ears go back, they kind of move away, and I'll note that, okay, they don't like that as much, and maybe that's something I'm going to avoid in the future for their motivation. Now, this is the important part. Anything can be used to reward your dog. Some things you have to get a little bit more creative with, but anything can be used as a motivator and a reward. So that could be a a uh, towel, a power tool, water, a fly swatter, all of these sound strange, but all of them are related to what gets your dog excited. So I want to show you a video here, which is just a compilation of my dogs throughout the years with their different kinds of things that they get really excited for. And I have used every single one of these things as a reward at one point or another. So let's jump into it. First off, we have Graphite. This is when he was super tiny. He started showing some interest in moving water with the hose. Not so much a pool, but moving water. And so I've nurtured that, and this is what he looked like a few days ago. 
So he's so excited about that hose. I can use this in my training sessions, especially on hot summer days. I could do an exercise, send around a tree, race over. Now this video is funny. <laughs> One of our dogs found a cone in the yard and he thought it was the best thing ever. I can use that. If he said, oh, this is so amazing. I want to utilize that. Here's my little Papillon. He thought that this dog bed was amazing. Like I said, not all things they like will I necessarily want to use as a motivator, but I could. Here's Carbon jumping up to get a horse-sized jolly ball. I had a different motivator I was trying to use on the field. She made it clear that was not what she wanted in that day. She wanted the horse-sized jolly ball that would be difficult for me to run with, but she loves it so I can use it. Speaking of other things that are not the most beneficial, this was a ginormous teddy bear, but my dogs went crazy over it. So I found one that was a little bit more manageable, still big, like as big as they are. But sometimes I run my courses in practice with those giant teddy bears. Here's a towel straight out of the dryer. This dog loved those towels. I can utilize that. Now this one's a little blurry at first because it's a bit of an older video, but this is one of those the dogs sometimes choose what you don't want. A cell phone, but I can find something similar and utilize that. And of course, the fly swatter. So anything that gets the dogs really excited, I'm taking that as a note so that I can use that in my training. So not everything on that list was something that I necessarily want to use every time, but I'm adding it to my list. So you want to make a list of at least five things, uh, toys and treats, and be specific. Be as specific as you possibly can. Just saying a ball or food isn't good enough. Be as specific as possible. Oh, she likes an, a squeaky orange tennis ball. She likes a hard, big purple ball. They're all different and they're all ranked differently from the dog's perspective. So the more that you can get them excited and focused um, and think about how they specifically react to those things, it is helpful to you. When I go into my training sessions, I have a whole bunch of different rewards in my bag because at the same time as they have those things they really like, I have to remember to also be flexible because the dogs, just like us, will be in different moods at different times. And so I want to be able to switch it up and play around with different things and understand that one day they might not feel like that is the most exciting and the next day that's back to the favorite. So now we're going to talk about using the motivator. So I love this picture of my little carbon. Now, this was when she was a puppy. She's now 10 years old. And this is something that I let my dogs do. <laughs> yes, that is my shoe. And she dunked it in her pool and was racing around and playing with it. But I was letting her because that's building up her excitement. Now, you personally don't have to do this, but I find that if I nurture my dogs when I first get them and let them have all these different play things, it's so much easier to find a motivator later on. If they're afraid to interact with things, it's a lot harder to get them going. Harder, not not impossible. So I just want to remind you of that. So as we're going through, sometimes my shoes get um, sacrificed <laughs> as we're going through. All right. So when we have our motivator, now we want to think about how we want to utilize that motivator, keeping in mind that we also want to keep that motivator sacred. Once we find that thing that they really, really love, we want to keep it for just training. If they have access to it in everyday life, it's going to lose its value. So that's why when you have your list of top five, have those really, really at the very top of the list things staying for training only and the things near the bottom of the list they still like and they can use that for everyday play. Now you want to take note of how your dogs play by themselves and with other dogs. What is their play style? Do they like to be chased? Do they like to chase? Do they like to wrestle and get really posy with their hands? All dogs and breeds like to play differently but if you take note of how your dog interacts with other dogs you can utilize that and try to mimic that in your session. Um, movement is your best friend. So even if you're motivating the dogs with food, you want movement. So I'm going to show you this video of how I was using movement in my session with my little yokai. So she likes to do 
food rewards. So here I am tossing the food reward for her to get the session going. So even though I'm using food, I'm utilizing it like a toy where I'm tossing it across the ground, I'm making a huge deal about it, and I'm doing little tosses for her. Now, same thing here, this is Valor. He doesn't have the greatest motivation. So as I'm rewarding, even though I'm rewarding with food, I'm moving around to utilize that excitement of movement. Movement is our top handling element. If you saw Stephanie's webinar on seven handling elements, that is the same thing. So even if I'm rewarding with food, I want to continue moving because that gets the excitement going. It kind of gets that prey drive going and gets the dogs really eager to keep going. And you can see how excited Phoenix gets here when I just add a little bit of movement into my session and I kind of get into that, um, chase me mode. He loves to chase frisbees. And so in that case, I just made myself the toy. Now, when you're rewarding, even with food, you want to think prey drive. This is one of the most common mistakes that people use when they are rewarding with either toys or food. And that is they act like the dog or um, is just going to go for it because you have it. I always think like it's a, a suicidal bunny rabbit. <laughs> like in the wild, a bunny will not jump in the dog's face to try to get their attention unless the bunny is sick. They are always going to be running around and being evasive. So here is a great example of that. <laughs> Very common. Don't worry if you do this currently. It's a very easy fix. Think prey drive. You want to be moving the, do the toy around, dragging it on the ground, moving it sporadically, keeping it exciting. You can see how much the puppy lights up in these moments where it's a little bit more of a keep away game. Look at how exciting that is. <laughs> Such a huge difference from the dog's perspective. So think prey drive, dragging the toy around on the ground, keeping it exciting from that perspective. The other thing that you want to do is make sure that you are being genuine with your rewards. The dogs can tell when you're rewarding from the heart and actually having fun versus just pretending like you're having fun. So try to make sure that when you are rewarding you're not just rewarding with that motivator you're also rewarding with your voice so this was actually a really great um session that Yanita had in one of our international training weeks and I wanted to include it here because I think that it's such a great reminder and she said it best so I'm just going to let her take over here and in when they this. use boat so show the hand so that she's watching and following that and then, yay! Yeah, so you always have to get that connection first before sending there. I'd like to hear more like when she's going backside, so when she's doing those off the head, yay, good! So you are telling her that she's really nice and you are happy and because you are really quiet and then just telling that, okay, now something happened, but make it more like, hey, that is good now, really good. They have been doing that research from uh, rewarding dogs. They were taught to be in that magnet so they can yeah, look the brains there. And then they were testing that if they just got a uh, ball or treats or something, what part of the brains were activated. And then if they were praising, the handlers like Woo what was and it was different part here mm -hmm. and when they used both both of them activated so it's oh, different okay. areas for the dog if you are just giving the ball or giving the food or praising or giving those both then the whole brains were activated there so learn to use that one so that it's not just something then it's much more meaningful for the dog later and they get more those good hormones from that one. 
So when it comes to rewarding, the more genuine you are and when you praise at the same time they are getting that motivator, it's actually creating an emotional response for the dogs. They're getting that emotional response. They're getting those hormones flowing. They're activating both sides of the brain. And guess what? That means that the next time you do that, they're associating all of those great feelings with working with you and getting that motivator. And that just keeps it all around more exciting. So keep that in mind in your next training session. Be genuine. And it's okay if you're not feeling up to it that day, just don't train. But we're going to get to that in a minute. Now, what is also important, this is another really important one that a lot of people make a mistake with. Not all dogs enjoy being touched when they're getting their reward. And you want to adjust your style based on the dog's reaction. So some dogs love being touched. And part of the reward is actually loving up on them and petting them and giving them just so much love and affection. But other dogs, they almost get personally offended when you touch them while they're in work mode. Note which type of dog you have because there are different oh, sorry there are different types of things that we want to do in those cases so I actually have some examples here because I have one dog in my house that loves being touched when she's rewarded so we're going to start with her video so this is my yokai as you can see based on her body language she's loving this her tail's wagging her body language is coming back for more each time i can utilize this touching in her rewarding to make it as valuable as possible now on the other side this is valor watch his reaction when i pet him as soon as i pet him he was like okay i want to leave this session <laughs> so i want to take note of that and then when i want to continue with the session and i go to grab his harness he moved away because he didn't want to be touched again so if your dog has that kind of reaction read that so you don't touch them in the middle of their session so here is titanium and here's how she's another one that doesn't really like to be touched so i'm utilizing that in my session with her where instead of like petting her and touching her i'm actually pushing her away from me and when i'm pushing her away that's getting her really excited to come back from more like hey why don't you want me and my toy so this is another one though that you want to read your dog's body language here i'm letting her win the toy then i'm playing some keep away and i'm just doing this like really sporadic play because this is how she plays with the other dogs but i want to take note here because if i do this style of play with some of my other dogs they will get offended so adjust how you are playing with your dog based on their reactions and you can see that each of the dogs when i adjusted how i was rewarding them they stayed intent on that session the whole time so don't be afraid to switch it up and, and mix it up. Some Sometimes they like being touched and <laughs> that's true that sometimes just because the dogs like to cuddle on the couch, it doesn't mean when you go out and work, they wanna be touched. So just note that. It's very true for all of my dogs, except that one, that they cuddle all day on the couch with me. But once we go out to work, if I touch them, they kind of give me that, oh, mom, my friends are watching type of reaction. So I want to be careful with that because I want them to want to work with me. And if they think at any sudden moment, I am going to be touching them and kind of ruining their day, like a they, that's their reaction, <laughs> then I want to be careful of that and adjust accordingly. And so you saw how I played around with that. Next, we're going to talk about choosing when you train. This is a big topic because this is going to make a big difference. So some people say that, oh, my dog doesn't, isn't food motivated or, oh, they're not toy motivated. One of the most common things that happens is that we have to find things that give them value in their life. So we wanna find times in the day that the dogs are naturally really excited. For mine, that is meal times. When I initially get a dog in my house, whether they're a puppy or an older dog, they train for every single one of their meals. The value comes from me. They don't get things for free. So a lot of times when the dogs aren't finding meaning in food or toys, it's because they have access to those for free so many times already in their environment. So I limit what kind of fun things they can have in that environment. So one thing I will do if I'm trying to build motivation, I will 
train them for their meals. And it might just be a small handful of their food uh, in the initial beginning before I do more. And I understand sometimes that's hard. <laughs> I've had puppies that I've done that with raw and it's a little grosser, but it definitely is still possible. And the other thing that I will do is I will limit the kinds of toys in their environment. So they'll get like chewy bones and harder toys, but all of their soft tug toys, they only get when we are playing together. So that I'm kind of setting that mood. Getting into a routine with the dogs will also help. So what types of times in the day do they get to go and do something? Do we normally go out and play chuck it? I can now turn that into a training session. So keep that in mind as well as you are working with your dogs. Now, as we have chosen a motivator, we've started thinking about how we can reward with that motivator, adding in movement and excitement and keeping the pressure low. Now we want to think about what that training session actually looks like when we do it. So the most important aspect is that you want to pre-plan what you're training. Have a plan when you're going into the session so it can just be immediately into focusing on the dog and working. When you bring your dog out, all the attention is on the dog. There are so many cases where we have a rough plan of what we are going to do, but what happens is we pull the dogs out and we immediately disconnect from them while we head off into our training session. We get to our first obstacle and suddenly, bam, we want the dogs to turn on and suddenly be focusing on us. It's not very fair to them because we have just disconnected from them. So I will normally, when I'm bringing my dogs out to train, I will pull them out of the crate, out of the car, out of the house, depending on where I am, already focused on me engaging. If I'm doing food, I'm doing little tricks on the way over with food in my hand. If I'm doing toys, I'm bringing them over tugging or I'm throwing it, depending on what the dog wants. Do they tug? Do they throw? I'm doing things like that on my way to my first obstacle. I have given myself no time to disconnect from the dog and therefore no time for the dog to disconnect from me. That's going to up my value for the dog. Um, that's why when you're bringing them out, you already want to have a plan in mind what you are going to do. Your session, especially when we're trying to build drive, should be more play than work. Now, the type of work is going to change depending on the dog's level, but I have a small example here. And this is um, an example of what I would do in a session. Now, if I'm doing coursework, obviously the session is going to be longer. I just wanted this to be a, a small example for everyone, but I want to keep my play really, really high. So this is a small portion of my session with Yokai again, where I'm getting her focused on me, I'm playing with her, engaging with her, and then I'm doing small exercises. This is um, little stuff. She's semi-retired. But I'm doing lots of play and interaction with her in the middle. You can see her body language stays happy the whole time. Here she was looking for a, a toy off to the edge and where I had all the cookies. She missed the cookie there. <laughs> She's like, oh, it's in the tunnel. But notice how the entire time I was doing that session, I did not interact with her or didn't uh, disconnect with her. This is Graphite. He was doing a little puppy session with some obedience. One thing, uh, recall with a, a emergency down and look at how much play we're doing in the middle of it. The exercise was such a small portion versus the reward. Now, as they get older, get more experience, keep the drive going, my sessions can get longer and longer before I reward, but I still want more reward and play than actual exercise. So do you think that he will leave this session going, oh, I don't wanna do that again, or, oh my gosh, I wanna leave and I want to do more. I want the reaction of, oh my gosh, I wanna do more, I'm so excited to do more. So keep that in mind that you want to keep it 
really exciting. Agility should be more like an amusement park than a boot camp. The more like a boot camp it looks, then it's just stressful. It's not as much fun for you or the dog. So keep it really light and exciting, no matter what exercise you're working. Even if you're working an international course with some really hard skills, it should be fun. If you are not having fun, the dog is not having fun. So keep the excitement there. The other thing that I will commonly do with dogs that I'm trying to build drive with is take away the start starting positions. So there's two things that I want to talk about here. One is when I'm building drive, I want to make sure that I am rewarding drive. So in my sessions, as I'm kind of starting to go, I want to reward those instances that the dogs have that really excited look on their face. Now, what does drive look like? It's going to look like different things for different dogs. Here's an example of what it slightly looks like for this dog. So in this case, he's kind of taunting the dog. You see the butt starts to raise in anticipation. Everything goes a little bit stiff. And then he gives the release word and everything just kind of rockets out. That is drive. This dog is anticipating that going. This is the type of stuff that you want to see with your dog when you're playing these games that keep it really exciting. Now, the other thing that I want to show you is what it looks like when we're taking away our start line positions. When we start talking about starting positions in agility, one of the main things that happens is that we um, add in this like focus here that we, we um, put in a start line stay and the dogs just immediately deflate in that moment. So in that moment, we had all this excitement building, kind of what you saw with Yokai and everything. And then all of a sudden we ask for that sit or that down and they immediately deflate. So when you are working through it, you want to take out those start line positions. You want to add in those slingshot positions. So for example, on. I have to find the video again. In our um, movement is great one. Let me pull this up again. You can see that when I'm starting with her, I am taking away any type of start line. I'm not asking her to sit beforehand. I'm getting that movement going. So for her, that was just kind of sending and going. Sometimes though, you need something more. And when you're doing that something more, like for Valor here, I'm grabbing onto his harness, I'm pulling it back, ready, go. That type of thing uh, when you're working. So keep that in mind that you can also take away that starting position by doing a little bit of a slingshot response and that makes a huge different from difference from the dog's perspective very easy for me to say so taking away that start line position and keeping that enthusiasm going and kind of taunting them ready set go type of reaction is going to be way more exciting than sit stay okay that type of reaction. So you can see how excited they were in that. All right, the last thing that we're going to talk about is how many repetitions in your session. Now, as you are working through your session, um, you want to think about always leaving with the dog wanting more. If your dog leaves the session before you, it's a good indication that you went too long. <laughs> you were either it was too much for them or it was um, just too many and so they got bored. There's a couple of different things that kind of go into it. You want to leave your sessions with your dog wanting more. Usually three to six repetitions are enough and especially when it comes to the techniques, most of the time it's more practice for us than it is for the dogs. So a good example of this is um, this session where Yanita and Tulia were working with their young dogs, teaching them force front crosses. These videos are from one session that they did. This was their first time learning those force front crosses. And as soon as they had success with that, immediately they're increasing the difficulty, adding another obstacle before or after, changing the direction they're going but they don't do the same exact thing more than once if they were successful. And that's kind of a, a, another really common thing is that people either do way too many repetitions of the same thing without increasing the difficulty or just way too many um, <laughs> repetitions in general. I got distracted by that. She was so cute running <laughs> through there. 
but all these puppies are so big now. But um, the goal is the same. You want to keep your training sessions interesting. And if we're drilling the same thing again and again, it gets boring from the dog's perspective. So this was some really fast repetitions for the dogs to do. And it keeps them wanting more. We're changing it up. We're keeping the repetitions really short. For some of the dogs, honestly, when I start out, if they're really, really unsure or unconfident, I might do one repetition, race them back to the crate. And if I have another dog, I'll take that dog out and do something else with them before giving that first dog the time of day again. But sometimes it starts out with that really tiny thing where, okay, this is how I can go out, I can have them engaged, I can keep them excited, and then I race away as fast as I can with them wanting more. If you leave your session with your dog hanging out by your obstacles or whatever you are working saying, hey, I just want one more. You know that you ended the session correctly and don't let them con you into doing more repetitions. Leave on that note like, yeah, you want more? That's good. We'll come back later, maybe in a couple hours, maybe in 20 minutes, maybe the next day, but leave with the dog wanting more. If you leave the session and the dog is like, oh, thank goodness that's over with. That was just so much. Then you know, okay, information, next time we're gonna do less. The other thing is a big myth. This is specifically when we're trying to build drive. You do not have to end in success. If something has gone wrong and you have already done quite a few repetitions, it's okay to end not on success. There are certain circumstances that you can walk away from the session and come back and try again later. Sometimes doing that one more repetition to get that success on whatever it is, is going to be that one repetition that takes the dog over the edge and goes, I'm not interested anymore. It is okay to leave the session with uh, on a bad note. Obviously, we don't necessarily want to leave the session on a bad note, but sometimes that happens and that's okay. It's okay to leave the session without a success and come back and get that success later. What's more important is nurturing the dog's confidence. So as you're working through it, do I have a fast, confident dog that's eager to work or am I begging the dog to work for me? And now I've done that one extra repetition and they're just so fed up with me. So try to keep it fair for the dogs as you're working through it and exciting. So I think that's one of the most important lessons. The other thing that I try to keep in mind as I'm working with my dogs is that you have to see them for who they are and not who you want them to be. So some dogs will always be a little bit unsure in certain circumstances. It's okay. Some dogs will never like tugging. Some dogs will never like um, bringing up the toys when other dogs are watching. Understand where your dog is currently in their training and see them for that right now not what you want them to be in the future. Take the steps as they happen, nurture that confidence and understand that eventually they will get where you want them to be. But you have to keep the pressure off and understand that they, just like you, are an individual. And sometimes things are just too much. So keep that in mind. One of my favorite sayings in agility that I say all the time is that agility should be more like an amusement park than a boot camp. If you get too serious with it, it takes the fun away, not only for you, but for the dog. Keep things fun and upbeat, even if you're trying to train a serious skill. Keep it lightweight and the dogs will react accordingly. So this is just a, a really fun photo that I love of um, my husband, playing with one of the dogs, Phoenix, because it's just that pure engagement. They're both having a really good time in that reward, and you want to see that type of thing happening. So I hope that you all enjoyed this and got to kind of think of a deep dive into those top five culprits that might be limiting your dog's drive, and that you're thinking quite a bit about what kind of things you can do to change what you're currently doing, what kind of motivators you're using, how you're using those motivators. Are you able to train when the dogs are really excited to train? Um, things like that. And keep in mind that you want to keep your motivators sacred so that it's not just something they get all the time, 
that keeps them interested and eager for more and know that sometimes distraction levels will require a higher grade motivator. But these are all things that we're going to dive into even more in depth in the follow up emails. So be ready to get those follow up emails that are going to send you some content from the website and extra information about each of these topics that we covered. And I look forward to hearing from everyone and what you thought of this. <laughs> I know that I had a great time. Motivators are such an important topic. Be sure that you have posted um, any type of, of thing that, that came up while you were watching this. Send us an email and let us know, hey, this was something that really struck a chord with me and this is how I'm going to be fixing it. All right, I hope that everyone enjoyed this and I hope that you and your dogs can continue to have a great time in your agility and life training. Bye.